Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this year's Distinguished Faculty Lecture. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here this evening. Established in 1999, the Distinguished Faculty Lecture is an opportunity for the college's accomplished, for a co the, one of the college's accomplished faculty members to deliver a public talk that offers a window into their expertise and prompts us to reflect on the value of a liberal arts education. It's my great pleasure to introduce this year's speaker, William Kane, Mary Jewett Geyser, Professor of English. The title of his talk is How to Enjoy Shakespeare. Professor Kane will be joined at the end of his lecture by Lisa Radensky, Professor of English and Chair of the Department of English, who will moderate a question and answer session. Professor Kane is an extraordinary scholar and a committed, compassionate teacher. Over his more than four decades at Wellesley, he is engaged in an impressively wide array of topics, always with his trademark exuberance. As one of Professor Kane's students put it in his citation for his 2001 Penansky Prize for Excellence in Teaching, and I quote, it's impossible to be unmoved, untouched by Professor Kane's magic. I do not know of any of his students who have not been transformed by the experience. His research encompasses 19th and early 20th century American literature, modernism in the arts, African-American literature, slavery and abolition, literary theory, and of course, Shakespeare. He's written about writers, including Ralph Ellison, Ernest Hemingway, George Orwell, Edith Wharton, Willa Cather, and the painter, Mark Rothko. Professor Kane is the author of The Crisis in Criticism, Theory, Literature, and Reform in English Studies, F.O. Matheson and the Politics of Criticism, and The Cambridge History of American Literature. He's also a co-editor of several college textbooks, including An Introduction to Literature, The Little Brown Reader, Literature for Composition, and the Norton Anthology of Literature and Theory and Criticism, among others. It's no exaggeration to say that through his scholarly work, Professor Kane has touched the lives of thousands of college students studying American literature, literary theory, and composition, both in the United States and around the world. In Professor Kane's classroom, Students listen to jazz as they parse the poetry of Langston Hughes. He often leads them to the library's special collections where they examine first editions of the work of Hughes, Robert Frost and others and seek out newspaper accounts of the eras that they are studying to better understand the social and political moment. As one former student of Professor Keynes put it, he's deeply concerned with educating students in a holistic manner, enabling them to become better scholars and develop their passions and intellectual curiosity. He's always encouraging them to integrate what they learn in the classroom into their understanding of the greater world and vice versa. I'd like to close with a memory from a former student that I so enjoyed hearing, which I believe showcases Professor Kane's profound exuberance for the subjects he so loves. And here again, I'm quoting from his 2001 Penansky Prize citation. And I quote, on his first day back in the classroom from an emergency appendectomy, Professor Kane got a tad too excited and made a huge sweeping motion with his arm to emphasize a point. He doubled over in pain and the entire class gasped in horror. But <laughs> Professor Kane said simply, it's hard not to get too excited with this and continued on with the class. <laughs> I'd be hard pressed to find a better example of the sheer joy and dedication Professor Kane brings to his scholarship, his students, to the Wellesley community and to the world. We are so fortunate to call Professor Kane ours and we are honored to have him speak about the joys of Shakespeare this evening. 
please join me in welcoming this year's distinguished faculty lecturer, William Kane. Thank you very much for those very generous and kind words, Paula. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to have been able to spend my career at Wellesley College, working with wonderful colleagues, wonderful students, and wonderful members of the staff. How to enjoy Shakespeare. William Shakespeare, born 1564, died 1616. The Globe Theater opened mid-1599. An open air theater, no curtain, center door in the rear, with an upper stage balcony above it where Juliet is when Romeo speaks to her, two side doors for entrances and exits, also the trap door, perhaps for witches, ghosts, and other surprises, the stage five feet high, 44 feet wide, 26 feet deep. Colorful costumes, music, singing, dancing, tumbling, dueling, sword fighting. Limited scenery, some sound effects. The audience in three stories of galleries and standing in the pit. Let's start by taking note in Shakespeare of discrepant awareness, a term I borrow from the scholar Bertrand Evans. This refers to the discrepancies in knowledge, the gaps, the differences among the characters on stage, a technique that Shakespeare uses to create and deepen dramatic interest and to build anticipation and suspense. We know that the diabolic Iago hates the more Othello and is plotting to destroy him. Othello does not. To him, Iago is a trusted friend, honest Iago. As we watch and hear them, we know that Iago knows what Othello does not. We know what is in the mind of the one and not the other. Now fill in the other characters. What does each one know and not know? And what does each one know that others do not? Shakespeare vitalizes our attention through these discrepancies and their operations with quicksilver and sometimes uproarious effect in comedy and disturbing and sometimes terrifying impact in tragedy. The Scottish play begins with the witches in thunder and lightning as they come to a close, intending soon a meeting with someone named Macbeth, all say, fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. The next scene focuses on King Duncan. He and his men know nothing about the witches and on the bleeding captain who tells of the loyal Macbeth in battle, brandishing a sword with bloody execution and with savage efficiency, killing the king's enemy, Macdonwald, and we soon learn from others with his fellow soldier, Banquo, routing still more foes. For his heroics, Macbeth will be honored as the new Thane of Cawdor. At the outset of the next scene, Shakespeare could have introduced Macbeth. He does not. Instead, the witches reappear in thunder and in gleeful back and forth about their wicked antics. This is our second encounter with them within between the Duncan scene that was vividly about Macbeth, about whom we were given images of relentless, remorseless soldiering, but whom we have not yet seen or heard. Shakespeare now brings on Macbeth and Banquo. They are referred to by these names in the first folio stage direction, but in a performance, we could be in doubt about who they are. Whoever they might be, we know that they know nothing about what we have been seeing and listening to on stage. 
enter Macbeth and Banquo. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. How far is it called to Fares? What are these, so withered and so wild in their attire, that look not like the inhabitants of the earth, and yet are on it? Choppy, chapped, choppy finger, skinny lips, beards. Speak if you can. What are you? Macbeth's first line is, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. We know, but he does not know, that he is echoing the witches. Shakespeare knows how to seize us. The witches, the pictures already inscribed in us of the brutal Macbeth's faithful service on the battlefield. Now, the entry of these two men, who are they? We pick up that Macbeth is saying that the day he is seeing perplexes him. He has seen nothing like it. But Shakespeare structures the line so that it gives us this information with a nettling opposite insistence. Macbeth's point is what he has seen. His words declare, I have not seen. Seeing and not seeing. Shakespeare has established and is augmenting a murky aura, an atmosphere of contraries. In the production we design in our minds as we read, we'll have to decide about the tone of Macbeth's first line. We will cogitate too about what Macbeth and Banquo are wearing, where each will be in relation to the other, how slowly or quickly they will be moving, what each will be doing with his hands and eyes as he speaks or listens. We will be making decisions which supplement and extend the process of decision-making that Shakespeare and his fellow actors made when in 1606 they performed this play for the first time before King James at court. And then in subsequent performances, we know from a contemporary report at the Globe Theater. Shakespeare gives only this one line to Macbeth. Banquo then asks, how far away is Fares? Where's that? Why does he want to know? Why doesn't he know? Why are they presumably going to this place? But before Macbeth can answer, Banquo in the same line sees the witches. We have seen them before, he has not. As we read his lines, we realize that Shakespeare has embedded information for the actors who are playing the parts and who are describing and responding to the witches. So withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth. The witches are linked by W sound as withered and wild. They do not look like the inhabitants of the earth. But consider to the meter how it beats. In a line of Shakespearean verse, the typical pattern is unstressed syllable, stressed syllable, unstressed, stressed. Ten syllables in the line. Listen to this phrase with no stress, just my normal voice that look not like. The witches do not look like. Now, listen, listen with the stress syllables that look not like. The stress gives a pulse of prominence to these words that look not like. They do look like. They do and they don't. The stress ever so slightly counterpoints the sense. Shakespeare again is accenting the disquieting mood conveyed in overt and subterranean forms from start to finish of equivocation, paradox, and duplicity. Through Banquo's reactions and questions, Shakespeare is pointing to features of the witches that make them creepy and mystifying and ambiguous. The choppy finger, the skinny lips, the female bearded maleness. So much is going on, the unearthly yet earthbound witches, Banquo's exigent address to them, and Macbeth on stage, reacting to what he is seeing and hearing, or stunned, half-hearing, 
from Banquo. Shakespeare chose to make Banquo the first speaker responding to the witches, not Macbeth. This decision led to others. The idiom of query and interpretation that Banquo would speak, and for how long, and when it would be time for Macbeth to join in. Shakespeare's choices. Macbeth then speaks, but only a line. Not who, but what are these aberrant figures? A question that the witches do not answer. Speak if you can, what are you? I'll hail Macbeth. The witches utter their prophecies, one of which is that Macbeth will be the next thane of Cawdor. We know this already. What then do you want to be the expressions on the faces of Banquo and Macbeth as the witches direct their eerie exclamations at Macbeth? In his writing, from moment to moment, Shakespeare is making decisions about word, image, stress, line, information, reaction, structural and thematic connections. He and the members of the dramatic company would then have engaged in collaboration, working among themselves, making yet more decisions about how to handle the scene. Remember, that Shakespeare had worked with these actors, these friends and colleagues for years. He knew what they could do, how he could stimulate and stretch them, even as he was also thinking about what he wanted to show and not show to the audience. Surely the correct choice for Shakespeare next would be to give a good sized speech to Macbeth. But once again, it is Banquo who speaks. And from him, we know how Macbeth is responding through a question that Banquo asks him before moving abruptly in the same line back to the witches. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? In the name of truth, are you fantastical? My noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. Shakespeare repeats the word fair, which for us reverberates sing song with the F sound and tolling sense of the word foul. We notice also the near rhyme of fear and fair, the polysyllabic resonance of fantastical, a word that Later on, Macbeth, his mind tainted and transfixed by murder, entertains as well. The esteem felt by Banquo for his noble partner. The single line momentum of confrontation, at once both propelled and impeded by Banquo's amazement of the GR sounds in greet, grace, and great you greet with present grace and great prediction. The signal that Macbeth must come across to both Banquo and us as rapt, that is completely fascinated by what one is seeing or hearing, filled with an intense and pleasurable emotion, carried away bodily or transported to heaven, Shakespeare puts the metrical stress on this word wrapped so it chimes like a haunting death knell. When we read these lines or when we perform them, we must not recite them as if we knew the whole in advance. Banquo is speaking in response to a situation. That is, he is thinking, he is finding the words. Shakespeare is giving him the words that express his baffled wonder as he takes in and attempts to process a weird and disorienting event. There is much more in this piece of text than I have noted. It is brilliant writing to thrilling effect. Shakespeare's choice making is moving before our eyes and ears at astonishing speed. It is only when we read in slow question asking motion that we gain glimmers of insight into the intricacy and pace of Shakespeare's inventions. 
he knew roughly where he wanted to go, the broad effects he wanted to create. But we could say that as he moved quill pen across paper that he was improvising, not knowing what would come next, but then in a flash, knowing. Shakespeare's formidable friend, Ben Johnson said, the players have often mentioned it as an honor to Shakespeare that in his writing whatsoever he penned, he never blotted out line. Johnson grumbled that Shakespeare should have done more correcting and revising. My guess is that in the activity of preparation with the other actors in the company, he may have done some. But Johnson is telling us something about how Shakespeare's mind worked as it manifested itself in writing. We might, by analogy, think of the impossible perfection in the paintings done by Jackson Pollock in his greatest period around 1950. or of the breathtaking virtuosity of saxophonist John Coltrane, shown a transcription of one of his astounding solos and asked to reperform it, Coltrane said that he could not. It was too difficult. If you want to know what we should be doing in liberal arts education, in the humanities, it is to me putting students in the company of artists like these three. It is a demonstration to them of the best that human beings are capable of. This exploratory and controlling intelligence and imagination, creative power, dedication, discipline and freedom. The freedom, perhaps combining confidence and some fear to work toward a goal while not quite knowing in advance what it is or when it will be reached. I will now turn to a scene from an earlier play, Young Hamlet's Encounter with the Ghost. I will lead us briefly through it with little comment. Together, we will see and hear the choice-making work that Shakespeare is doing. What is happening? Who is speaking? Who knows what and who does not? The word choice, imagery, the relationship of each speaking voice to the metrical pattern and the embedded stage directions and cues to the actors. It is the middle of the afternoon in London, 1600, 1601. Performances started at two in the afternoon in the hot sun of summer or the chilly drizzle of a too early fall. But this is not the reality on the stage of the Globe Theater. We know it is not because Shakespeare tells us. And as he did so, he knew that his audience would follow his instructions. The ear bites shrewdly. It is very cold. What hour now? I think it lacks of 12. No, it is struck. Shakespeare next gives Hamlet some reflections about the bad habit of over drinking in Denmark, which prompts the character into brooding words about the single defect in a person that could undo him. These unhappy musings continue, which is Shakespeare's intention precisely so that the appearance of the ghost can strike Hamlet and us with a shock against this abyss of interiority. Listen to the tones, see and feel the images, visualize the animations of the actors on the globe stage, the speed with in some cases one character picking up and completing the half line uttered by someone else. There is frenzy in Hamlet and the others in their words and actions which Shakespeare plays off against the specter of the silent father figure clad in armor beyond apprehension, daunting and frightening. This is incandescent writing, fantastic theater. Enter Ghost. 
Look, my Lord, it comes. Angels and ministers of grace, defend us. Oh, answer me. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, cursed in death, have burst their sermons. That thou, dead coarse corpse, dead coarse, again in complete steel, say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? Beckons. It beckons you to go away with it. Look with what courteous action it waves you to a more removed ground, but do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my Lord. Why, what should be the fear? It weighs me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempts you toward the flood, my Lord? Think of it. It waves me still. Go on, I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my Lord. Hold off your hands. My fate cries out. Unhand me, gentlemen. Go on, I'll follow thee. Let's follow. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Nay, let's follow him. Tradition says that Shakespeare performed the role of the ghost. If so, he was writing the scene for himself, even as he also was writing for his friend, the leading actor of the company, Richard Burbage. Shakespeare inhabits the form of a person who cannot stay dead, a perturbed, looming, and irresistible presence that soon will command a bereaved and adrift prince to become his father's revenger, a murderous mission that the father, harrowed in the afterlife, cannot undertake. Time travel to the Globe Theater and take in the uncanny vibrations of the scene. You and I in the audience have been watching and listening to Shakespeare and Burbage on the stage for years. And here they are again, this time, the beckoning ghost and his son. As he was writing, Shakespeare knew who in the company he was writing for. We want to be thinking about collaboration, cooperation, members of a company putting on performance after performance, play after play in conditions that were hard and unpredictable, burdensome, fatiguing, but that were also full of vitality and the excitement of working with all kinds of dramatic material, trying everything, bringing forward prismatic characters and enthralling stories, making theater. We do not know the dramatic company or companies, there were a number of them, for which Shakespeare wrote his first plays in the early 1590s. But we know that he became part of the Lord Chamberlain's men in 1594, and that he remained with it in 1603 when James I came to the throne and when this company under royal patronage was renamed the King's Men. No other dramatist of the period enjoyed so long and close a relationship with a single acting company. Shakespeare wrote for it for nearly all of his career whereas most of the other playwrights of the period were freelancers. Shakespeare was an actor as well as a playwright. And in this dual capacity, he worked closely with the other adult male actors and with the boy actors who performed the women's roles. No women appeared on stage until 1660. He was familiar with his fellow actors' styles and personalities, and he knew furthermore the theatrical tasks that he could expect these actors to take on for each new play that he wrote. The more successful that the productions by the Lord Chamberlain's men and the King's men were, were 
the more money the company made. Advertised on playbills posted around London, theater going was very popular. As many as 15,000 men and women attended plays each week in a London population of 200,000. The people who came to the performances also relished cockfighting, bull baiting, and bear baiting. The theaters and the pits were in the same locale. And in this disreputable section of the city, there was plenty of drinking, gambling, crime, and prostitution. Thousands of people packed together for these entertainments. When outbreaks of plague struck the city, the authorities closed the theaters, sometimes for many months. When the theaters were open, no performances were allowed on Sundays or on holy days. But otherwise, depending on weather, since most of the theaters were open air, performances were six days a week. The only scheduled exception was Lent, the period of 40 days before Easter. Audiences wanted an ever-changing schedule. And for this reason, each of the theater companies in London presented a different play every afternoon, Monday through Saturday. For Shakespeare's company, the mandate thus was six different plays for the actors to prepare and perform each week and dozens of plays every month. There was much doubling and tripling of roles and hence many lines to learn with very little time for rehearsal, maybe only one before the first performance. No director, just the actors working together. Each actor was given a roll of paper that contained his lines and cue words, which saved a great deal of copying, but which meant that the actors could not peruse the entire text. During 1604 to 1606, the new plays performed by Shakespeare's company included Othello, King Lear, and Macbeth, plus Revivals of the Merry Wives of Windsor, the Comedy of Errors, Love's Labors Lost, and the Merchant of Venice. Plus, comedies, satires, romances, and tragedies by Ben Jonson and other playwrights. About 30 new shows, new plays, were written for the Globe repertoire between 1599 and 1606. And the authors included not only Shakespeare, who wrote 14, but also Johnson, Thomas Decker, George Wilkins, and Thomas Middleton. For still other plays, we do not know the name of the author. Of the plays written from the 1570s to the 1640s, we have the texts of 543. Some 3,000 others have been lost. Beginning in 1594, Shakespeare was a sharer, that is, a, an actor who had invested capital in the company and received a share of the profits from both productions in London and touring shows cross country, hundreds of miles beyond the great city. In 1599, the Lord Chamberlain's men began to perform in the open air Globe Theater with a capacity of 3,000 people. Along with others, Shakespeare became part owner of the theater itself. In 1609, the company, now the King's Men, began performing two in the smaller indoor Blackfriars Theater, capacity 600, with Shakespeare again holding a share. They now could make money year round from productions in two theaters. Playwright, actor, sharer in both the company and the Globe and Blackfriars, Shakespeare says scholar G.E. Bentley was the most complete man of the theater of his time. No other man of his time is known to have been tied to the theater in so many different ways. We might by analogy value John Coltrane for his brilliant soloing, but even more for his membership in a quartet and other bands. Still more to the point is the musical director, band leader, composer, writer, arranger, and pianist, Duke Ellington, 
one of whose pinnacles is Such Sweet Thunder, a sublime album, 1957, that took shape from Ellington's and his friend and collaborator Billy Strayhorn's immersion in Shakespeare. Ellington said in 1931 that he wanted to make contributions to the literature of music. He referred to himself as an amateur playwright. He chose his title from a line in A Midsummer Night's Dream. I never heard so musical a discord, such sweet thunder. The jostling of meanings against each other, the music of discord, the sweetness of thunder, Ellington rejoices in the playfulness, irony, wit, and surprise in Shakespeare. He also hears that this line alludes to the higher harmony achieved by disparate members of a theater company or jazz band working together amid and through their differences. This implies the antagonistic cooperation that the blues novelists and cultural critics, Ralph Ellison and Albert Murray, find in the ideal and in the arduous and so often jeopardized but steady and steadfast progress of American democracy. For many, one, we should not say stay fixated on our separateness, but affirm and draw upon the core humanity and allotment of skill in everybody for the labor that the greater good requires, for the future that the beloved young will live in. Well, here do we find leadership to remind us of these truths. Ellington once had a couple of guys in the band who were feuding at odds. He wrote a piece of music with invigorating solos for each. Through the music, two subdued their differences. And in the context of the other musicians bestowed on the audience the citizenry of jazz, a remarkable gift. My surmise is that Shakespeare did versions of this many times for the actors in his company. Bring people together, use their different, even competing talents, lift all to a higher place, making magic on and off stage. Shakespeare voices through his characters the perennial themes of love and death, the best and worst that humankind is capable of, the mesmerized. Herman Melville in 1850 spoke with dreadful awe of those deep, faraway things in Shakespeare, those occasional flashings forth of the intuitive truth in him, those short, quick probings at the very axis of reality. These are the things that make Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Melville continues, <clears throat> through the mouths of the dark characters of Hamlet, T Hamlet, Timon, Lear, and Iago, Shakespeare craftily says, or sometimes insinuates, the things which we feel to be so terrifically true that it were all but madness for any good man in his own proper character to utter or even hint of them. My main message here, however, is less about Shakespeare's thematic and philosophical intensity than his command of the medium. Passion for experiment, participation in a dramatic company, and presence in his work as an artist. The sheer aesthetic pleasure that he gives us as we experience his spellbinding entertainment a pleasure that is available for everybody. Worldwide, for centuries it has been, as has Ellington's music, which he and his band and their travels brought to every corner of the globe. 
Shakespeare and Ellington are geniuses, and it is natural to feel they dwell on Mount Olympus. But while it is true that we must rise to some challenging heights to enjoy their body of work, they are not really gods. Isn't it a relief to remember that Shakespeare and Ellington breathed as we do? One day, they no longer did, as will happen to each of us. For me, this gets at why the key to their minds, the motive, power, and illumination of their artistry is their conception of a common humanity that should be our own as well. Great art emerges from creators who operate within specific social and cultural contexts who know their materials and their audiences, meet them where they are and elevate them beyond that place and who in the deployment of their craft always have in their sights the abiding realities of desire, hope, love, loss and death that every person is touched by. This is in the textures of the writing, in the colors of the dramatic music. It could be that we enjoy these artists the most when in our response to their performances in drama and in music, we feel in contact with their love of the work they are doing. We are witnesses to their exercise of choice-making art. These choices coming from years of preparation, practice, knowledge, experience, and interaction with both gracious and testy friends and collaborators in the company. We know that coming to enjoy Shakespeare takes intellectual effort, resolve, and grit. It is not always a smooth process, not at all. It requires concentration. But on the other side, it requires, in happier terms, a readiness and willingness to feel the joy of discovery. For instance, for instance, the excitement in a classroom when everyone cooperatively brings to light some of the turns, twists, meanings, and implications of Shakespeare's language. Or this can happen when we are alone, reading, having some trouble, but then are lit up by a Shakespearean epiphany, a word choice image line that astonishes us, a section on the page of sight and sound that links us to Shakespeare and the members of his company. Human beings trying to make a living, acting together to do some good for each other and for the people buying tickets to see and hear them. So much on a page of Shakespeare is complex. It is indeed like life, hard to figure out. Yet along with the complicatedness, there is also Shakespeare's deep simplicity. Be alert for and receptive to these moments too. Nothing could be more direct at the climax of the story than Hamlet's parting words. The rest is silence. Or in King Lear, the blind Gloucester's anguished perception, I see it feelingly. We feel these words are true, even as we know we will never wholly know why. They reassure and resist understanding. Through Hamlet's final phrase, the rest is silence. Shakespeare wondered about what comes next. It could be a mysterious silent beyond into which language, including that of his most voluble character and that of his own will disappear. That's a possibility. We do not know. In the meantime, not there yet. While we exist, there will be sorrow, grief, pain, <laughs> but balanced against Tough thoughts and feelings is the radiant precision of the words that Shakespeare brought together to identify them for us. There it is, perfectly stated, permanently embodied. In this respect, 
even as Shakespeare hurried from day to day with his fellow actors to put on successful shows to make money, he was writing for the future. Of course we have our differences. Shakespeare's worlds of characters are full of them and the conflicts they engender. But he knew and he sets before us the absurdity of being consumed by them. Such a waste of spirit this is. Shakespeare did not dare to imagine that all persons are ultimately the same. He took it for granted. He could function at the highest level of creative choice-making art because he was committed to truths that he knew unite us. It was the preparation that was tremendous, said Billy Strayhorn about his and Ellington's work for such sweet, such sweet thunder. We read all of Shakespeare. They attended performances at the Stratford, Ontario Shakespeare Festival and talked about the bard with scholars and actors. Band members nicknamed Strayhorn Shakespeare. He knew many Shakespeare sonnets by heart as well as entire scenes of plays. And they marveled at Ellington's copy of the plays, chock full of heavily marked and underlined passages. Ellington and Strayhorn made decades of beautiful music. About one of their collaborations done by phone when, while Strayhorn was in New York City and Ellington was on the road with his band, Strayhorn said, it was as though we had really worked together. Or oh, one person had done it. It was an uncanny feeling, like witchcraft, like looking into someone else's mind. Ellington called his friend, my right arm, my left arm, all the eyes in the back of my head, my brain waves in his head, in his, in mine. The pieces that these men composed, each is a gem, including Sonnet for Sister Kate, Lady Mac, The Star-Crossed Lovers, Sonnet in Search of a Moor, and Madness and Great Ones. Ellington and Strayhorn knew the skills of the players in the company, Harry Carney on baritone sax, Cat Anderson on trumpet, Johnny Hodges, Clark Terry and others, and they wrote for them. They knew what these musicians were and they had a well-grounded premonition that if given intriguing foot-tapping tunes, these musicians, the one and the many, would perceive and actualize even more. Ellington commended himself as the, the world's greatest listener. For decades, he listened with rapt attention to formal and informal playing by his musicians, catching at a phrase in the air here, heeding another one there, notes, cues, clues. Ellington listened. The band fed his creative process. I am certain that the same was the case countless times with Shakespeare and the actors whom he performed with, listened to, and observed in action amid the rush and variousness of productions day after day. These men and boys were Shakespeare's impersonators, collaborators, and in a sense, his co-authors. Ellington memorably said, my band is my instrument. And this is true. But the personality, prowess, strengths and limits of each and every member of the band, a band that had lots of continuity, but that also was in motion with departures and arrivals over many years, this musical information nurtured and fortified Ellington all the time just as the contributions by his actors inspired Shakespeare. With astute irreverence, Ellington recalled his delight in riffing on Shakespeare. I kept thinking what a dandy song Lady Macbeth would make. The girl has everything, noble birth, a hot love story, murder, even a ghost. Then there's Othello and Desdemona. There's a swinging story for you. What a melodrama. What a subject for the blues. Blues in the night. 
Ellington said, somehow, I suspect that if Shakespeare were alive today, he might be a jazz fan himself. He'd appreciate the combination of team spirit and informality, of academic knowledge and humor, of all the elements that go into a great jazz performance. And I am sure he would agree with the simple and axiomatic statement that is so important to all of us. When it sounds good, it is good. Here, as I conclude, you and I again hear the affiliations that weave together artists, collaborators, and colleagues, and readers, and audiences. The bridging of the not alike, the transcending of differences. By implication, we hear as well both the need we have for the arts and the obligation we have to give this experience to others, to bring them to the good. We read, study, and experience Shakespeare, and as educators, we maintain that the humanities, literature, painting, music, and more matter. Because through them, we provide creative space for young people to realize and articulate the reasons why for themselves and others, <coughs> life is or could be worth living. The more that we enter into Shakespeare's character creation and playmaking and come to enjoy the evocative dynamism of his dramatic language, the more we will embrace him as a genius who is also a soulmate, one of us asking questions, desiring, dreaming. Shakespeare makes us know and feel how much we have in common. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. My name is uh, Lisa Rodensky and I am the chair of the English department. Uh, Bill was my teacher when I was a student at Wellesley. Um, one of the losses of having this event on Zoom is, is the silence uh, when a speaker finishes a talk that is so moving and meaningful at this moment. And um, I think I might just take a moment uh, for all of us and appreciate uh, what Bill has given us. I've taken some notes myself. Um, the idea that Shakespeare reassures and resists understanding, which I think is brilliant, um, that Shakespeare is a soulmate. Um, thank you, Bill. Uh, I know you can't hear the applause, um, <laughs> but it's happening. Um, and uh, I've also had the pleasure uh, to see some of the questions um, that are coming in. I know we're at eight o'clock. I also know that um, you, uh, more than almost anyone else I know, is so engaged by questions, students' questions, um, the questions of, of readers. Uh, so um, I'm gonna try to get to some of them, but there's no question so to speak, that we won't uh, get to all. But I'm gonna start actually with a question from, uh, from a former student, Paige Calvert. Oh, um, sure. Uh, lots of uh, students and former students are writing in. Uh, a great tribute to you, Bill, uh, speaking also as your former student. Um, but Paige asks first um, whether there's a production of a Shakespeare play that stands out to you um, that exhibits the best that Shakespeare has to offer. Your talk was engaged so much with the, the immediacy of the Shakespearean production. And, and uh, I wanna know this answer myself, whether there's one that you know, comes right into your mind as, as such a moving experience. I'll say first, Lisa, that 
I want to pay tribute to the wonderful Shakespeare students I've taught over so many years. And so many of those students, they were members of this Shakespeare Society. What a wonderful organization. What a welcoming group of students is the Shakespeare Society. I've seen, I think, nearly every one of their productions since I have been at Wellesley. I have vivid memories of multiple productions of some of the best known plays, Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, Romeo and Juliet, A Midsummer Night's Dream. But the Shakespeare Society also uh, has put on productions of some of the less well-known plays, Titus Andronicus, a great favorite of mine, Richard II, but one perhaps not so widely performed. I might, Lisa, this might be a funny response to your question, but I might, <clears throat> instead of looking backward, I might urge all of the uh, terrific friends, faculty members, students, family members, and others, alums, who have tuned in today to be looking ahead to Friday, April 23rd, <laughs> Shakespeare's birthday. And I think all, all of us will enjoy enormously <clears throat> a brilliant, a dazzling reimagining of Romeo and Juliet directed by the brilliant director, Simon Godwin. PBS, Friday, 90 minute Romeo and Juliet. I've seen some clips and it's uh, uh, a, a thrilling, production, fast paced, powerfully uh, expressed. Let's all look forward to that production. Uh, Mr. Godwin is artistic director of the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, DC. This is a great gift coming our way Friday, Shakespeare's birthday. Uh -oh. Well, thank you so much. Bill is frozen for me. I'm not sure he's frozen for everybody. There you are. Good, Thank good. You. All good. Thank you, Bill. That's, <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, another question that's come in, um, I've, I'm very compelled by it myself, is about improvisation. I think a lot of listeners were very struck by the way you connected uh, Shakespeare's language, the way characters seem to be in the moment, to, to, uh, it isn't improvised, we know, because it's uh, on the page and the stage. Um, and the great uh, jazz artists, Ellington and others. Can you say a little bit more about the, and even your sense of the improvisation that happens in the classroom when you're talking about Shakespeare? So I think uh, listeners wanna know more about how I mean, that's part of the enjoyment. How does Shakespeare make us feel that it's happening in the moment, that it's almost as if the characters are thinking of it even as they're speaking the lines? Uh, I think it's, it's uh, wonderful and it's terrific. And oh, it's so exciting, Lisa, to be in a classroom with wonderful Wellesley students, uh, maybe some of them experienced in Shakespeare, maybe others very new to Shakespeare. And to bring the students up to the front of the room, oh, do I hunger to be back in the classroom with students, their bodies <laughs> moving around the front of the room, trying out, having fun with Shakespeare, yeah. being confused in moments, uh, but, but all the while sensing as we work with Shakespeare. Remember, he wasn't writing books, Lisa. He was writing scripts, right. working with the uh, dramatic language uh, that is so full of embedded stage directions and cues and clues to the actors for how to speak, where to look, how to react, how to respond. Uh, but then on top of it all, 
you and I, Lisa, and the other students in the room, or actors when they're in the rehearsal room, they are trying out, they're improvising, they're going in one direction, retreating from it, trying something else, going in another direction. Actors have sometimes told me that yes, the actual performance is great fun, but what was really fun, what was really exciting, what was really stimulating were the rehearsals. That's terrific. Uh, also, uh, the sense that that's also what's happening in the classroom. Um, another uh, uh, question um, is, and it's sort of connected, um, is there a play that you would recommend to someone who says they don't like Shakespeare or even I think more commonly that they can't read Shakespeare, it's so unfamiliar, it, it feels so much above them. Is there one play to start with, do you think? We should remember, shouldn't we, Lisa, that, uh, that uh, Shakespeare is exorbitantly and infinitely meaningful, but Shakespeare also too is difficult. Difficult sometimes because he wrote 400 years ago. Yeah, difficult on other occasions because Shakespeare is moving his language into dimensions of human thought and feeling that language can barely, if at all, capture and express. In other words, we should not feel dismayed or pained or aggrieved if we do not understand each and every word of even our favorite Shakespeare play, right. the Shakespeare play that we may know, know the best. Uh, films help, productions help, reading a little bit at a time, maybe reading with friends. It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to start a little Shakespeare group, suggestion to alums who maybe didn't have as much opportunity to study Shakespeare or Wellesley as they wished. Right. Uh, 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 as I said, Shakespeare takes persistence. It's sometimes hard, but I think if we're stalwart and steadfast and are open to Shakespeare, when he's speaking to us, when we feel in contact with him, when we feel intimately connected to the, uh, characters at their most joyous and characters at their most despondent. Uh, uh, I, I think that the, the rewards of Shakespeare are immense. That's terrific and actually leads into another question from another former student. I mean, I think if we went through the participants, uh, <laughs> it would almost be like a Wellesley reunion of some kind. We Maybe we should do that, just the students of of Bill Kane, uh, there are a lot of us who would attend. Um, but but Amy Ashbridge asks, um, how, I love this question. How can we go forth and take the lessons and examples into sort of real practice, even if we're not teaching it, we're not in the humanities? I, I love that question because your talk is so much about the way, in some ways, we are more alike than we are different. My Angelou once said, and the way Shakespeare speaks to those uh, commonalities. Uh, this probably is not a great answer, Lisa, to your question, but I think a little bit about, maybe this sounds overdramatic, about higher education and what we try to accomplish in it. What we're trying to do uh, through our hard work at uh, Wellesley the leaders of the institution, the faculty, the students, the terrific support staff. <clears throat> uh, we're trying sciences, social sciences, and humanities <clears throat> to conserve and preserve the best that has been thought and said, which we are always re-examining, reassessing, articulating in new and compelling ways. We try also to be, all of us, sciences, social sciences and the humanities, to be thinking about the best that is thought and said right now, here in the present. And maybe 
it's exhilarating, it's challenging. Think about and try among ourselves and with our students, the best that will be thought and said next year, five years, 10 years from now. So uh, in our work, we're, we, we try to have this very rich and vivid, simultaneously, one in the same time, conception of past, present, and future interwoven, interlaced uh, together with all of the uh, 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 fields, departments, programs, uh, all across the span of the college, cooperating and collaborating graciously, as I said in my talk, and maybe sometimes testily, but that's what Ellison and Murray are getting at when they speak about antagonistic cooperation, that we can be at odds, we can disagree, we can dispute with one another, maybe even sometimes get a little angry with one another, but we're moving forward. We're working toward a common goal. We're like uh, members of a jazz group. Each one gets a little time, Lisa, to solo and to show his, her, or their stuff. But it's all one unit, all working together to make beautiful music. That's wonderful, Bill. And maybe it, this is a slightly more limited question, but I, I see it in some of the comments here. Um, you and I both know that Wellesley College is actually one of the few English departments left that has a Shakespeare requirement. And yeah. you and I have talked about that a lot. And as a department, we've talked that, about that a lot and we continue to talk about it. And it, it's a question that, that probably comes up for us um, every year. And uh, there are questions about whether one of your 120 students who's now a junior uh, Tarini Sinha has asked about how we think about the way Shakespeare occupies this space that sort of no other author occupies in our English curriculum. Um, but I think, Lisa, we need to understand Shakespeare in the right way. From one perspective, we study Shakespeare, we require Shakespeare in the English department at Wellesley because of the vastness of his literary importance and influence in terms of sheer knowledge. To us at Wellesley, it makes exorbitantly good sense to study Shakespeare and require a Shakespeare course for our English majors. <clears throat> but I think we also need to understand just the the openness, the experimentalism in Shakespeare, the million and one reimaginings of Shakespeare that have been done across uh, the centuries, across recent decades, race, gender, ethnicity, all of these uh, tremendously innovative and bold and daring and provocative and risk-taking and maybe sometimes unsuccessful efforts to, to work with Shakespeare. If Shakespeare were here, he would be saying to us, don't think of me as a monument. Right. Think, of, think of me as an embodiment, an right. epitome of creative openness. Right. Shakespeare would be the first to say if he were here, all right, if you want to, you can study me. Thank you for your, uh, maybe I could charge you a penny, Shakespeare. <laughs> His company charged a penny to right. the groundlings who stood in the pit. But Shakespeare would be saying, I want you also, of course, to be looking outward. It's the spirit of that openness, of that discovery, looking outward. Shakespeare would be saying, read more, study more, move into, into new areas of discourse. Think better, think more deeply. Uh, don't be satisfied, be intellectually curious, take big risks and chances. Sometimes you fall on your face, but get up and keep moving forward. I think we have to think of Shakespeare as a, as a <clears throat> yes, yes, as a brilliant author, but also as an inspiring and vitalizing presence uh, in our lives and in the curriculum. 
and in uh, his relationship to uh, English and American and world literatures. That's wonderful, Bill. I, I know we're at 815 and I, I, I know we can't answer all the questions. I, I just wanna say a couple of things as we close. One is I know there are 532 people in the audience, but one of Bill's great gifts as a teacher is you really feel he's just talking to you. So as you're talking, Bill, I just think it's the two of us uh, having a chat at lunch. And that is a gift uh, beyond measure. Um, and the second thing is how much you bring uh, to my mind again, the great line from King Lear, that's true too. That's true. Uh, that's true too. Yes. And that your sense at the end of Shakespeare saying to when someone raises an objection, that's true too. Um, and I, uh, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, Bill, for your service to the English department, your service to the college, your service to the discipline. Um, I, I can't really put into words how grateful I am personally and, and looking at the comments of your students and people who are here. Um, I just wanna say what gratitude I have and I wanna speak for everyone else uh, for this opportunity uh, to hear you speak about Shakespeare. So I think we'll bring it to a close. I, I know that uh, there is a recording um, of this event, which is wonderful. And um, uh, I, I and what a lovely way to end this day. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody.